Octagon 24-7's podcast, MMA Fan Pass. It's MMA for the fans, by the fans. We talk about only the important things you want to hear. Hey, this is Mike Goldberg, the voice of Bellator MMA on Spike. Join us right now for MMA FanCast. Welcome to another episode of MMA FanCast brought to you by Octagon 24-7. I am joined by my main man, Jim Sahara Mooney, and we are on the heels of a huge weekend of MMA action. Uh, we were live and in person at State College, Pennsylvania, uh, home of the Penn State Nittany Lions, I might add. Um, and seven and two, the 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 two straight tough losses for for the Nittany Lions in a ten hour game or something like that this this past Saturday. But Crazy. we Friday night we were there for Bellator one eighty six. We have a lot to talk about with this experience. This was actually Sahara's first time with full media credentials. And so we're going to share kind of what that was about. We are MMA FanCast. And what that means is, hey, we're just some, we're just some uh, fans of the, of, the, of the fight game. We're fans of the sport. And, and we are going to uh, share some of those things that, like, you wonder about, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff. This is what we envisioned uh, from the get-go when we launched MMA FanCast. And so that's what we do here. Um, so Jim Sahara Mooney, this was your first event with the credentials and all that stuff. So um, I know, uh, I mean, obviously we were both excited, but I think you were particularly excited because you hadn't had that um, full experience yet. So yeah, just share share with the listeners what that was like as a as a fan and now as a journalist to to go there and to uh, have that experience. Yeah, what's up? What's up? What's up? Um, you know, we had the, uh, credentials for 180, what was it? 180, 178. Was it 178? Well, with them, well, them 180 NYC, but yeah, yeah. That's what I was talking about. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Those were Um, partial credentials. Yeah. Um, but you know, on the way back, um, we had, I had talked to you about growing up and being a fan of sports in general. And I would always look at different sporting events as, well, that's something I'll never do. I'll never be able, you know, to, I'll probably never have the chance to attend this event, like Super Bowl, World Series, and so forth. And now that, um, I mean, we've, we've been to some huge, um, huge MMA events, both on the Bellator side and uh, on the UFC side. And now having uh, got my first full set of media credentials from um, start to finish for uh, all the fight week um, activities and then the fight and the, uh, the post-fight press conference, now I, I look at things in a different light, and that is – what we're going to do next or things that we have to put on the list, chalk them off, you know, make a bucket list. That's my wife's favorite word. And, and just start knocking them off. And one of the things that they talked about a lot, um, I shouldn't say a lot, but post fight press conference, I think uh, Ruth made mention of this and Phil Davis, and that's possibly fighting in Japan. And I don't know if it was necessarily with, uh, with Ryzen, but, you know, I, I can see us sometime in the near future um, covering a, an international event. That would be very cool. That would be um, something special for sure. All right. Um, so that, that being said, one of the things you said there, when we started this journey, and if you haven't been a longtime listener, I'll briefly recap how all of this began uh, with MMA FanCast and with our website, Octagon247.com. We went to three friends, just went up. We live in Pittsburgh. We went to uh, longtime MMA fans, I might add. We've been watching M- – Jim and I have been watching MMA together for quite a few years now, and uh, and we went to UFC 203 – in Cleveland, Ohio, which is, you know, a two and a half hour 
drive from us. And um, we, we, we happened to stay at the same hotel as the fighters. And so for, for like three days, we went up early in the week. We went up for the press conference and all of that stuff. And, and so we got up there Thursday through Saturday and we were, we stayed in the same hotel as all the fighters were staying at. And we were just kind of hanging out in the lobby and talking with the fighters and just doing all this cool stuff. And we were like, you know, this would be really cool and, and uh, to, to do something more. And I had a decent video camera and I just started like video camera, you know, videotaping stuff. And uh, the fighters were kind of acting like we were like media. They mm-hmm. were kind of acting like, hey, you know, like promoting themselves and stuff. Right, right. So we just went along with it and like acted like media would act or tried to anyway and just had fun with it, right? And so we we were talking. We said we should really start a website, start a podcast, do all that stuff. And um, the third guy who was uh, – who kind of – hung on for a little bit, but it wasn't really his, his shtick was, was, uh, what's, what was his stage name? Terry Dactyl. The Terry Dactyl. Um, he was our third, our third guy that was with us, third buddy that was with us on the trip. And, uh, we just had a good time. And, and I remember us, um, saying, yes, we're going to do this. We're going to start a website. We're going to do this. And all three of us were like, yeah, and then we got back and, and Jim and I actually did this stuff, like went and got a domain and did all that stuff. And then learn, like we'd had no idea about podcasting. We had no idea about any of that stuff, anything about website development and design and all that stuff. So and we we're still, still learning that stuff too. That's still. We absolutely. We're still learning. We've learned a lot. Uh, we've been doing this for a little over a year now since uh, about a couple of weeks after UFC 203. Um, and so that's kind of what how this all got started. One of the things we said is, you know, it'll be nice to be able to go to some card. Like a goal of ours was to go to some cards and and only have to pay to get there and back. Like, hey, we can get maybe we can get media credentials to somewhere and we'd only have to, you know, afford the cost to travel there and back. And so that's part of what we've, we've done. We've, we've not really put a lot of focus on making money yet. We want to have a product that's, that we feel we're ready to have sponsors and have, have commercials and all that stuff. So we've been focusing on our content for the past year and try to make it better and try to get better and and give the audience what they want. And, and I think we've done a lot of good in that sense. Um, we have, we've learned a lot and we've, we've taken what we have learned and done the best with it. And I mean, there are things that I never expected. Like you, I always see, and I don't know if you're like this at all, Jim, I always see, um, YouTube videos and, you know, you don't pay really any attention to the thumbs up and thumbs down other than to see, okay, there, if there's a lot more thumbs up than there are thumbs down, then it's probably pretty good. Um, but there's always thumbs down. But when you get your own thumbs down, you're like, oh, man, someone gave us a thumbs down. They hate us. Like, we yeah. are terrible. <laughs> and so, um, and then the comments on some of the YouTube stuff are just like, you guys stink. And that's very well true in Jim's case, but I don't, I mean, that's just not true. So all, all in all, what we were, what we were trying to do, we've done a lot of cool things. Hey Ryan, your audio is cutting out. Really? No, I'm just joking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we've done a lot of cool things. We've done, we've had a lot of fun with this and who knows where we go from here, but that was kind of, just to kind of set up this um, this weekend where we had uh, really two people with full credentials at, at Bellator uh, 186 at State College and really um, getting to know and build relationships with a lot of the fighters, a lot of the Pittsburgh fighters and Western Pennsylvania fighters like Goss, um, Ethan Goss. And um, it's just been a great experience. And so, um, what so Jim, what were um some of the most exciting moments or like different moments and as you multitask there with having side conversations with your family, 
Um, <laughs> what, what were, what were, what were you surprised about or what, you know, what was different? What was a lot different than you thought it would be? Well, um, one of the things that I actually enjoyed was, uh, at first we had, you know, alternated fights with the live, um, reporting or live posting of the results or, you know, as each round occurred, we would post, um, post what happened rounds one, two, three, you know, the finals, um, scoring and so forth. That to me was, was different. We've done that, you know, sitting at home and watching, uh, pay-per-view events or, um, you know, fight night cards, stuff like that. And it was, it was a different feeling, completely different feeling because now we were inside the arena and it was, um, the, the crowd and the atmosphere in there added to how I was experiencing the fight itself. Yeah. So that was something that was completely different, something that I didn't expect. Yeah. And uh, we had full access. We they had uh, fighter workouts um, on Thursday, and included in that was Ryan Bader, um, Linton Vassell, the Cell. Sorry, you got it. Um, we also had Ali Malay McFarlane and Emily, Emily Ducati. Emily Ducati. Ducati, and, Ducati. And who else? Uh, Ed Ruth. Um, Ed his Ed. opponent was not there. Chris Dempsey. Um, yeah, D- Dempsey was not there. Leo. Leo Leite. Uh, yeah, is it Leite or Leche? Is, it's, it's a different kind of pronunciation. I, I don't yeah, know. yeah. Um, but just, just being there as – a, 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 as a part of the media was completely different, obviously for di- for many different reasons, that, as opposed to being there as a fan. Um, but that part never left me. That's one of the things. And you were right there at one point, um, having got caught up in some of the action, where we have to refrain our excitement, especially you know knowing these guys. You know, we've we've covered them locally. Um, you know, followed the, followed them um, for the past few fights, and having a par- personal relationship with them and knowing something about these guys, it's hard to sit back and not want to get up on your feet and um, and root for your guy. Um, but we had to somehow rein that in. Yeah, I, caught, I had to catch myself a couple yeah. times. Now, um, speaking of that, um, there was a fight between Mazzotta and, uh, and Lozano. And the, there was a fellow next to me. He was, um, he was with, uh, I forget the name of the organization. I think it was My MMA News or something like that. Oh, and, that, was the, that was the guy next to you? Yes, yes. That's, so that's what it was. He interviewed um, Lozano. No, well, I mean, since then he interviewed Goss. It was on yes. it was on SoundCloud today. I I, I didn't uh, catch that part. Um, I did see he had posted uh, an article um, about Goss, and I think he had something on there about um, Lozano and how he broke his arm, um, twenty stitches, and so forth. But during that fight, I had you on my left hand side, and. I believe that was the fight where um, you let out some excitement. And just before that, on my right-hand side, I heard something like, go Matt, loud. And I knew it was really close, within, I'll say, 10 feet. And I caught out of the corner of my eye somebody cheering. And it was right there on, uh, on Media Row. And... After that fight had happened, you know, some things were going on, getting caught up in the, in the posting and um, just, you know, the, the action surrounding that particular fight. And then once things had settled down, I turned to my right and I ended up talking to, um, to that guy that was with uh, my MMA news. And it turns out that he knows, he knew Lozano, he was from 
the Philly area, and the cheering came from Lozano's dad, who was right next to, um, you know, the journalist from my MMA news. So yeah. he had come up and uh, grabbed the chair on me. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the um, thrill of victory, the agony of defeat, that kind of thing. Because uh, you know, we we certainly experienced that as well with uh, Dempsey and and Goss losing and um, and uh, Mad Reed. Dog. Yeah. So yeah, it was uh, it it was neat to you know, have, just like you said, on one side, on my left-hand side was, you know, the, the thrill victorious and, you know, pulling for your fighter who's doing well. And then on the right-hand side, I hear, you know, what turns out to be a family member and um, the fighter's father pulling for his son and trying to, you know, pull him through some things that he's experiencing on the, uh, on the negative side. And it was just interesting to hear that so close to me. Normally, you don't get that even being in a crowd, you know, it's, you get fans cheering on both sides, but you don't get that personal, um, personal flavor, I guess you could say, um, with, you know, the relationship to the fighters and, you know, watching somebody's reactions to how things are unfolding inside the cage. Yeah. I think the coolest, uh, the coolest experience for me, other than, you know, watching, uh, you know, the guys, Wilkins and Mazzotto, you know, get, get great wins. And, um, outside of that be so, uh, you know, leading up to Bellator 178, I had run into Dominic Mazzotta and this is, so this is in April and that was really, um, we had covered an event a local Pittsburgh event for Pinnacle Fighting Championships, Pinnacle Fighting Championship 15. It was in December, and that was the first time we we met uh, Dominic Mazzotta. Uh, and we spent a little bit of time with him there, did, an, did a post-fight interview, and uh, that was that. And then um, covered him in April and uh, for that Bellator, got credentialed for that, and – uh, interviewed him, went to breakfast with him there. And, and that w- ended up being a bad fight for him. Um, a fight where he blocked a head kick and it still found its way through and, and, uh, and, and put him, you know, put him down. And uh, so, you know, the, the running joke was like, you know, don't let Ryan interview you or certainly don't, don't share a meal with him. And, uh, but yeah, Dom's, I forgot about that. Yeah, Dom's uh, Dom's stronger than that though. Uh, he knew he knew uh, that. Well, hopefully he knew that I had nothing to do with it. As a matter of fact, he joked with me. Oh, last time I had a meal with you, uh, you know, didn't turn out too well. And I said, well, I'm not blaming myself for that. <laughs> but so the cool thing for us was, um, for the coolest thing for me was on. Uh, the night before fights on Friday night, um, I was walking down the steps. It was after the uh, uh, weigh-ins, the ceremonial weigh-ins, and uh, came down the steps of the hotel. And Dom was down there. And as I was coming down, he said, "Hey, you want to go to? You guys want to go out to out to eat, get some dinner?" And I was like, "Absolutely, yeah." And so we went. We, it was like a who's who of ridiculous. Um, combat sports, Pittsburgh and Western Pennsylvania people. There were D one, you know, Penn state wrestlers. There were trainers, there were fighters there. It was like, we were so out of place. It was unbelievable. All these people physically are, are physically so gifted in combat that we were like, we we don't do that yeah but you know what what the cool thing about it is the only thing they brought to the table with regards to combat sports and mma was just the conversation there wasn't anything that um, they said or did that you know pointed to us as being outsiders or made us feel as outsiders i mean we were included in the conversation and they even asked us different things about our side of the sport and what it's, you know, what we podcasting. Yeah. Yeah. 
so yeah totally cool guys just you know all of them all those guys were were great and uh there's an, actually an article on octagon 247.com about that uh meal and just that experience and if you want to check that out uh feel feel free it's a you know dinner with dom and healy and and green greeley and all those guys so yeah and the other thing about that is you know i i started i don't want to say i felt any pressure but it was just it was a different feeling leading up to um the fight you know as like i think i had asked you one time is like around two um a little after two you know when do you want to get ready and then it was three and you know three thirty and i asked you again and um you know so you know inside of me you know i was building with excitement not really knowing you know what to expect and how things were gonna gonna play out so yeah that was something that you know i will uh, i'll always remember that first you know first time that we had or that you know together we had full credentials from start to finish um it was, it was interesting but we both did yeah 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 um well and and you know you spend the day or a couple you know meals with a guy and you're you know you're personally invested in them you know, they're your friend you know he's you know dom's been nothing nothing short of a an awesome guy with us even though he was a little short with me um <laughs> so here's a <laughs> here's a funny story so jim's writing an article um what to expect with the prelims, uh, Bellator 186. It's on, you know, obviously on the website. And so he's writing the article. He goes, hey, what, what is – this is um, probably Thursday night yeah, at, yeah. At, at about um, maybe 8 o'clock. Oh, no, no. It was, it was Wednesday. It was Wednesday night because – he was still way into Thursday morning. Yeah, yes. yeah. It was Wednesday night. You're right. Wait, Wayans were yeah, Wayans were Thursday morning. Yeah. So Wednesday night, um, I he asked me, you know, I'm writing this article. Hey, what what belt is what belt is Dom and BJJ? And I was like, I, thinking to myself, I I think he's black, but I don't know for sure. Like we can't write it if we don't know. So. I shot Dom a quick text, not really thinking much about it. Um, the fact that <laughs> probably pretty angry at this point <laughs> at life. Um, but he's in the middle of a weight cut. And so I text him. I knew he was, but I figured, eh, this is just a one, one word answer. And, uh, and I say, you know, Hey, what, what belt are you in BJJ? And he says black. So I'm like, okay, cool. It was a one word answer. And, so that gave me a hint, like, don't ask any more questions. But just to make make that clear, <laughs> I get a text 11 minutes later that says, I'm done answering questions. <laughs> and I said, I, I said to Jim, yeah, Dom, Dom's cutting weight right now, for sure. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so, yeah, the first thing, next time I saw him was right after weigh-ins, maybe an hour after weigh-ins. And we just saw each other. We just like made eye contact and he, we just both smiled ear to ear. And he's like, dude, I'm so sorry. I was, I was completely miserable until about 15 or 20 minutes ago. So yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah and oh, that's another lesson learned. Don't ask questions to fighters who are cutting weight. That is true. Yeah. Um, yeah. Don't, don't ask, don't ask some questions. If you need material, you better be prepared, you know, the, uh, the week before when you're doing your interviews um, because they're angry the night before weigh-ins. Angry. They're, they're <clears throat> angry. Like, he was – yeah. I could tell he was pretty angry. He was – I think he might have been hangry too. Yeah, hangry. He could have been hangry. Um, okay, so we had uh, – I you know, you know what really made me proud was – we had some guys from Western PA on this card that were really uh, in, in some, not necessarily like, like I think about Goss and I, I don't think he was really in any bad spots, but he was kind of not able to do much for the first two rounds. I think of uh, 
Francis Healy, and he wasn't able to do much. In, and, and they just made me real proud because they were relentless and they just kept coming and, and trusting their, 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 um, their skills and their stamina and their training and all of that. And they did not let up one bit. And I think of, you know, there were some other people on that card where you saw, you saw they didn't have the heart that these guys had. You saw them, you know, stop essentially just not giving it their all. And, and our, my, you know, our guys just, you know, the Western PA guys made me, made me proud to live in this area just by being, it's not about always like winning and losing fights. It's about like doing, stretching yourself and, and, and being the best you can be. And, and uh, I don't know, I was just real proud of them. That's a good way to put it. Um, it's that uh, the blue collar mentality and the, uh, the hard work, um, you know, you're never done until, you know, somebody says you're done. They just, they keep on going until either, you know, somebody wakes them up. Hopefully that's not the case or, you know, the bell rings, to, you know, to end the round and the, and the fight. Yeah. So the other um, thing I wanted, you know, as I'm looking at these different fights, I, I just want to, you know, make some comments on them. Mike Wilkins, Brett Martinez fight. I felt like Brett Martinez got, um, got into it with Mike Wilkins and he wanted no parts of it. I felt like he was like, I had no idea um, that it was going to be like this, like that this dude was this good. I had no idea because they had identical records. Mm -hmm. but it was very clear from very early on in that fight that Wilkins, Wilkins is, uh, you know, a very, very skilled guy. And you know what? He had his hands full because um, the beginning of the fight, uh, Martinez – I think he went for a shot and had uh, had Mike up against the cage and kind of got him from the side, if I'm recalling correctly. And it was right in front of us, um, right near the door. And I remember Mike, I, I forget which way he was turned. I don't know if it was um, turned to – I think he kind of turned to his left and he was able to start throwing some hammer fists. Um, and I think it was landing on his back maybe. Or hit you know side closer to the rib cage, but up high, and you know it was it was neat to see right up close. Here's you know one of the fighters you know, and you've you know gone in depth with conversations about different things you know leading up to the fight, um, you know how he got to the point that he did, and now you know we were watching him in action, and um, I. I thought Martinez was was a stiff challenge for him. I you know I wasn't really sure what to expect, but you know Mike definitely. I think he proved he's on a completely different level than Martinez. Absolutely, absolutely. He he definitely separated himself. Yeah. And then um, Ethan Goss, man, he he had a really tough loss um, to take. Here's the thing, I you know. I don't know what the deal is with the Pennsylvania if they've adopted the uh, the new rules of MMA. If they have, then I think this is a co completely incorrect decision. I I don't I feel like the third round was undoubtedly a ten eight round under the new rules. I think it was probably pretty close to a ten eight round under the old rules. You could arguably give it a ten eight round on under the old rules. Would I? Um, under the old rules, I probably wouldn't, but I also wouldn't fault someone who would. So if that says anything, uh, first two rounds, I don't, there was really no damage. I think, you know, cage control. I think Salas had that, uh, and, and, but didn't really do any damage. Um, and so that's the hard part to really swallow is, you know, he had him against the cage, but did no damage, did nothing to him. 
and uh, didn't get any takedowns. It was just um, he controlled a lot of the those first two rounds, and that was it. And then the third round, Ethan Goss just took it to him. Dominated. It totally dominated him. Yeah. And so I, I, I can see where there would be two rounds to one as a, so do I think that's right? No. And that's kind of the rule set that's in place that we all know about. Yeah. So, you know, if I'm Jason Dignan, um, you know, even if you think you, I mean, I, I probably would have said, I, I think you, I think you have to finish this. If it was the old rules, if it's the new rules, go out there and go full bore and, you know, the worst case scenario, it's a draw. I, I don't know. It, it's, it's tough. It's tough. I think Ethan's very um, disappointed that it, the decision went the way it did. It was a split decision. He had one judge's scorecard. Yeah, it's tough. It's a tough one. Yeah, I had to go out to uh, to our vehicle. We had left some equipment out in the car, and um, this was, I believe, this was actually in between the prelims and the main car. We had some time to go and do this, and I had I ran into Ethan. And you know, go back. Um, I'm going to go back. Get get back to my conversation with him when I ran into him, but uh, go back to the fight. And clearly, clearly, that crowd was all for him. And at the end of for the fight, oh yeah, yeah, heavy, heavy um, crowd favorite. And uh, at the end of the fight, based on the way that they cheered, you know, everybody thought that this was a fight that, you know. Um, they could see it being close, but but that he definitely um, came out on top. And when the decision came out, you know, it was big, big disappointment, um, not just, you know, with Ethan in his corner, but, you know, majority of the fans who – Well, and he's from State College and was announced from State College. Right. I mean, regardless of anything that went to the decision – with the state college crowd, I mean, they were going to, they were going to boo, uh, right. you know, a, a non-favorable decision, but yeah, I don't know. It's, that's a tough one. It's but see, tough. that's that, um, a, what I said to him, you know, he, he, you know, I was, I was in a rush cause I didn't want to miss anything and he grabbed my arm and, you know, I realized it was him and we talked for a minute and I just said that, you know, I, he's, you know, got nothing to hang his head about. I thought, you know, he put it all on the line and, um, and that, you know, he did well, um, you know, and he felt like he won and thought that that was a 10, eight round in the third, but walking away from him, um, you know, I, I went back to thinking about a conversation that you and I had and, um, and you wrote an article on this. It's on our website. It's on octagon247.com. Um, and it's what Bellator 186 did that UFC, you know, and the fight night. UFC Pittsburgh didn't yeah. even try to do. Yeah. It, it, um, the atmosphere was, is really what they created in there by bringing in the local talent and guys, you know, relatively, you know, Western Pennsylvania guys and Central PA, State College guys. You know, and and the even Philadelphia guys. The whole. I was just going to say that, yeah, it just it was an atmosphere they created that, you know, when you have a small venue like that, it just you know makes it seem bigger than it is. And, I don't think it was a small venue. No, but I'm just saying, you know, it was, uh, you know, with the way Bellator sets up um, their their seating and they they bring people in um, like WWE style coming down the ramp and. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, there's no viewing from behind there. So, you know, I feel like they're, they're creating a more intimate, um, atmosphere and getting you as close as possible. And you, you know, fight night in Pittsburgh for USC was nowhere close to that. Although it was a good night of fight fun atmosphere. It wasn't, yeah. it was a completely different type of atmosphere, right? It wasn't personal. 
which right. brings more passion. Uh, you know, Bellator 186 was very personal. A lot of people were personally invested. A lot of people were personally, like, there's a whole different feel. Like, there was a much better crowd atmosphere at Bellator 186, in my opinion, than there was at UFC Pittsburgh, UFC yeah. Fight Night, whatever number it was. Now, um, one of the things that I, you know, I mentioned it to you, we talked about it maybe for a minute or so, and I wanted to um, talk to Scott Coker about it, never got the chance, even when he was, you know, um, at the uh, the post-fight press conference. Um, I wanted to ask him this, but I just, I, you know, couldn't get a chance to say it. But it was on a college campus. Um, you know, college sports in general, you know, college football and the atmosphere around that, there's more passion and pageantry. Um, and it seems like the fans are really, really invested in their college football team. Professional sports, NFL – you know, it's there also, but it's different. It's a different crowd. And with what they did at um, at a college, on a college campus, hearing, you know, Ed Ruth um, did this, and I think uh, Phil Davis did this, you know, after the fight inside the ring, you know, where they did the, the We Are Penn State chants. It was just – it was neat to hear, neat to experience, and see the crowd – react to that we we experienced that with stipe in cleveland oh yeah. yeah you know it was that was that was electric it was just something that you know, even thinking about it gives me goosebumps and um i thought we could never relive something like that like we experienced that crowd well and cleveland. we experienced the crowd for mcgregor at 205 as well mm -hmm. um you know the the irish faithful as well i mean that was just a that's a whole nother another thing but as far as uh okay so here here's a question i have for you who do you think got the biggest pop outside of um ed ruth and phil davis uh i would say uh mazana dominic yeah. Yeah. yeah i think he did too i was i was floored i felt like it was even more than phil davis then it was Ed Ruth, Dom, um, Phil, Phil Davis, and then I would go to probably Ethan, Ethan Goss. Yeah, so it was it was pretty incredible how much Dom Mazzotta was cheered like yeah. by a crowd. I mean, it's not this isn't Pittsburgh. You come to Pittsburgh and he is a crowd, you know, crowd favorite and everything like that. But I mean. That was a really, really good following, um, a really good pop that he got from the crowd. Yeah. There had to be people that knew about him outside of those that traveled from Pittsburgh because yeah. it was pretty significant. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that would, that would um, pique some interest, um, you know, in the MMA community for fans if – if Bellator did something like this where they did, and I mentioned the college tour, um, it's just, it's, you know, something that neither organization has done before to my well, knowledge. I think maybe having one in, in Scottsdale and if ASU, you know, ASU campus seems like a, a no brainer for them because, you know, they got Bader from, you know, an ASU guy that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, was on this card so uh hey there was someone i i, I want to talk about that was making his pro mma debut and he is someone by the name of taiwan claxton oh. <laughs> and guys ladies and gentlemen if if you have not seen taiwan clax well first of all you need to hear him first and foremost. You can go to the Octagon 24-7 page, uh, the YouTube page, and we have all of the post-fight interviews as well as tons of other content um, on, there as, uh, on there from uh, Bellator 186. But Taiwan Claxton made quite a splash for his MMA debut, did he not? Uh, or for yeah. his pro MMA debut. Yeah. Um, 
and he landed knee first with that splash. It's unbelievable. It, you know, we were um, we were talking about this, and you, you had mentioned this before about preparation for the podcast um, for different events, um, whether it's pay per view or just a fight night um, or Bellator card, and doing your research, getting to know the fighters that you know, at the bottom of the card and then just working your way up. Yeah. And I got to do this with this card and putting that prelim card together and looking at all these guys. And when I came across him um, and just reading some things that he had done in college, um, you know, the, uh, the adversity that he faced um, his senior year and really was, uh, he was trying to get a, a fifth year out of it um, and what happened to him. And then, you know, ultimately, um, going with uh, signing on with uh, Black Zillions, it is, I, I saw nothing but um, star power or star power potential for this guy. And he did not waste any time in putting on a show that, you know, was what was it, less than 30 seconds? I don't even remember what the time was. It was a minute and a half. Okay. Yeah. It, it, 129. You said that during the fight, too. You said, what was that, yeah. 30 seconds? I, said, I know. And a half. Um, so this, what, what, what you were talking about, about preparing for, you know, going through the card and just researching all the fighters and stuff. Uh, let me tell you, when you do that, it makes the card so, like the entire card. Normally, you know, if you're just watching as a fan and you take a look at, you know, the – the fighters you know, and then the, there's fighters that are up and coming or fighters you don't know. Um, and you learn about them by watching them fight. But if you break down a card, it makes the card so interesting when you, when you have these guys that you've researched and you've like kind of watched some film footage on and, she, and you say, Oh, I see why they match these two up. They're total, total opposites. And, and so either one of them's going to sleep or one of them's getting knocked out and then, and then something totally different happens or, or that actually happens. It, it just makes it very interesting because um, you're, you're, you're kind of internally trying to process like what you think is going to happen. Yeah. Um, so in doing that, that was, there were, there were two fights really that uh, stood out for me. That was one. And then the other one was uh, Logan Storley and Matt Secor. Um, and just looking at things that they had done you know, in their career up to that point, um, didn't have a huge track record for, um, for Claxton, but just in what I had read about him, um, his skills, it just, everything pointed to keep your eye on this guy, you know, cause something spectacular could happen. And sure enough, it did. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Well, yeah, in the other fight uh, with Storley and uh, and Secor, um, Storley came into the fight um, six and zero, oh, um, and all of his victories, I think he was six and zero. Oh, they were all um, by knockout, and um, Secor was a submission specialist. I think he was nine and four coming in, um, but going back to amateurs, I think. I want to say he had four fights and three uh, subs or five fights and four submissions. So we'll just say, like, you know, um, he had 12, 13, maybe 14 submission victories. And, you know, so this fight was either going to – you know, my prediction was it was going to be an exciting fight and it was either going to be knockout or submission. Um, lots of submission attempts by Secor. Clearly, you know, uh, Storley had uh, really cut him open um, and, you know, was going for the, for the knockout punch, but the guy was a gamer. Um, that's the, uh, th again, going back to um, the fellow sitting next to my right um, with what was it, my MMA news, he knew something of uh, C-Core um, that, you know, this guy loves to brawl and, you know, don't worry about if, if you see him get bloodied up or it looks like he's, you know, taking some heavy shots, it's, it's what, you know, what he likes to do. He's the Justin Gaethje of the Bellator. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so let's just briefly go over some other things. Um, 
Alim Alay McFarland, the new flyweight women's champion, the first ever flyweight women's champion in Bellator history. And let me tell you, I this girl is awesome. She is awesome. She is cognizant of marketing herself. She's cognizant of being um, interesting and all of those things. And she's got this marketability. She's got this smile, this this uh, demeanor that's very uh, you know magnetic. And um, and she has a great corner uh, a corner man trainer that is um very marketable as well and right, yeah and they just make a great team they came out in the weigh-ins and put on a show for everyone um just absolutely great and then she came in and 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 did a really nice job and and ended the fight when we we pretty much all thought it was going to go to the decision she ended the fight in the fifth round she didn't uh she kind of went through fought through uh you know tiring in the in the first round kind of like spending a lot of energy early and then uh fighting through that and then having her second wind and really proved that she um is a top flyweight fighter in the world and the top flyweight fighter in Bellator. It was uh it was interesting to um to get to see her up close and personal for that first time at the uh the open uh workouts and you know we just had you know uh like a short encounter with him but with him whenever we talk no elima you said him you said we had a short encounter with him i i, I think i was going to try and say elima oh. um but you know she was she was genuine there was during her uh her interview at the uh, at the open workouts she mentioned how she loves doing the interviews she loves the the social media aspect and everything about that but i got the sense that it's not something that she is going to get caught up in and the limelight is really going to you know blind her to what she needs to do you know once you know she gets into fight camp and, you know, zone in on her opponent and how, you know, she's got to take her out. But um, I, just, I just got that she is an intelligent person who understands what she needs to do, not just as a fighter, but um, as a, like you said, a, a marketable product for Bellator and something that could, you know, start lifting Bellator up um, and inching closer to that number one spot, you know, with Bellator being number two um, organization in the world for combat sports. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There are a lot of um, things that, you know, with only 12 minutes left here in this podcast, a lot of things we're not going to get to um, that we want, we kind of wanted to spend some time on. So I want to get on to some things I definitely want to spend some time on. And that's talking about Dominic Mazzotta's fight. Um, with Matt Lozano, the actual fight, what, uh, just to, if you recall, as, as we said, you know, obviously um, we, we have a, 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 an ongoing professional relationship with Dominic and he's, you know, we're, we're very cordial with each other and he's a good guy and we're, we're you know, want to see success for him. So watching him fight, um, you know, we were wondering, like when he fought at Bellator 178, I was nervous for him. I was uh, I was nervous, and and that didn't uh, that didn't end up ending the way we wanted it. To, no, the way we wanted it to. Um, but this fight, you asked me right before the fight. You said, "Are you nervous?" What did I say? Do you remember? No, I wasn't nervous at all. No, not at all. Yeah, well, that was that was what I meant. No, not yeah. that I didn't remember, but yeah, you said no. Yeah, and 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 I don't know. There was just something about knowing Dom and knowing his skill level and knowing his intensity and knowing what he was going to bring at one. Th Listen, he fought at one forty-five against a beast. You look at that fight against AJ McKee, and there's a huge size difference. 
And here's the funny thing. A.J. McKee is not a big 45-er. He's an, he's an average 45 size-wise. He, I think he's a great talent. But size-wise, I think he's about average. And he was towering over, over Dom. And, um, and so there was a big difference there. Um, just knowing how good Dom is, I, I wasn't worried at all. I felt – and I and I said ahead of time, I, I felt like this was a good matchup for him because um, I felt like this is something he could dominate. And he absolutely came in and just dominated from start to finish. He was throwing some, uh, you, know, sp- uh, you know, spinning heel kicks and uh, doing some fancy stuff on, on the feet to start the round and then got the takedown and it was, it looked easy. And then he was relentless from there was <laughs> hit him with a really hard, hard elbow that busted him open. Mm. Um, it ended up ending the fight. And I think he broke his arm too or something. Yeah. I, I read a report somewhere that this was 10 seconds into the fight where, uh, where Lozano had uh, broken his arm and I forget, um, I don't know, I think it was a kick, actually. I think Dom started it um, with a kick. So, you know, two and a half minutes um, of that fight, Lozano had to fight with a, a broken, um, I believe it was his right arm, broken right arm. But one of the things that, uh, that I noticed right away is the pace um, of that fight was dictated by... Uh, by Mazzotta, and it left Lozano with nothing but um, having to react to everything that that Dom was throwing at him, and it was he was relentless with his pressure. Oh man, he was he was on fire. Uh, very cool thing. Next week we'll have a really special episode of MMA Fancast as we'll, we will have Dom on the show. We will have we will have many of these fighters that we are talking about tonight on the show, um, and it'll be very it'll be a really special um, special edition. We'll get to hear from all these guys uh, and hear about their fight and their experience. I mean, Dawn, this was the second fight in Bellator, but um, the rest of these guys, this was their first you know chance to fight on the big stage with you know Goss and. And uh, and Wilkins and um, obviously Dempsey has been in in the UFC as well, but um, you know just Francis Healy and those guys. So we're gonna hear a lot of cool stuff next week about their experience, about that all that good stuff. Um, so it'll be a great episode. That would be definitely one you won't want to miss. We haven't even touched on. UFC yeah. 217, which we yeah, do that other event. for a couple minutes here. Um, wh- what was this, Jim? The third, fourth event in UFC history that had three title fights? I believe, uh, I believe it was the third. Um, so what was that? Was it 205 that had three? We were at um, 205? 205 three, yeah. Okay. Um, so I know this is definitely at least the second. But I, I think you're right. I think it was the fourth. Uh, I know we have notes on it, but I don't uh, recall. Uh, UFC 33, 205, and, and 214. So this was 217. Okay. So c- crazy. I mean, you, things like that, you just, you know, you watch the fight and you're like, oh, wow, three title fights in one pay-per-view or one event. You know, but you never – it's well, never happened before where it's – See, that's the thing. That's the thing is, is, you know, I don't know what the betting line was on Joanna, but I would assume it'd be pretty high. Um, Cody Garbrandt, TJ Dillashaw was pretty close to even. Mm-hmm. And, and so was GSP. I think GSP was a slight favorite. Yeah. So I think Cody was a little bit of a favorite. I mean, this shouldn't be as shocking as it was. I, uh, I didn't see Cody losing. I did not see him losing there. And uh and fortunately the timing of when he when he caught 
when he caught TJ in the first, fortunately for, for TJ, it was late in the round and he was saved by the bell because I, I mean, he had his wits about him. I'm not going to say he was out of it, but he, he also was in big trouble. Yeah. And, and got saved by the bell. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I was pulling for him and, you know, my wife wanted to see it and uh, we stayed here and um, I think you were there with, what was it, Dan and uh, Travis. Uh, but, you know, anyways, everybody that I talked to and I'm assuming, you know, the guys that you were talking to, it was uh, a Cody, Cody fan fest. And um, to see him lose it mm. was, was definitely disappointing. You know, I like TJ. Um, I've, you know, been a fan of his for, for a while now. Um, but I just, you know, I, I was pulling for, uh, for Garbrandt and, uh, he, you know, he'll, he'll have other uh, nights to, uh, to redeem himself. And I'm sure that he will with the type of uh, person he is, not just fighter. Cody's not only young, he's also incredibly talented, incredibly skilled. So, I mean, I, I still expect Cody to be a long time champion in that division. I, ex- I completely expect a, a GSP like run at the, you know, as a champion with him. And I, ex- I didn't expect this to be, um, I expected it to be current and, you know, be ongoing, but um, GSP lost to lo- lost a big fight too. And so, um, you know, against Matt Sarah, that was an upset. So yeah. I, I think that he could still have a GSP like run in him. Um, and I fully expect it. I, I, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind that he'll do that. Uh, oh, oh, you know, I'm looking over this, this list and I totally missed it because it was at the very top and that's Josh Fremd. Josh oh, Fremd yeah. with an absolutely just a tremendous performance in his second uh, pro fight. Uh, he's fought quite a bit uh, as an amateur, but his second pro fight, he's still undefeated now at two and zero. Gets a big win and and a and a, and a big organization in Bellator. So that's a great uh, notch on his belt. So happy for him. So happy for for all these guys. But uh, you know. Josh Friend really uh he he impressed me. He got to open the the entire card mm-hmm. and get, get everything started on the right foot. Yeah, that uh see you see um two big guys going at it like that and the ending it with the uh, the rear naked choke um was uh was interesting. I, I wasn't expecting that. I thought that uh that it was gonna be more of a a brawl standing toe to toe. But um he's got some skills. He's yeah. uh, somebody that uh, and everybody should keep that name in the back of their minds and pay attention next time you hear it. Well, he's got a good good frame. He's 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 got length on him, and and he's got uh, you know good skill set. So I'm excited for uh, for what he has going on for him as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What other closing remarks do you got? Um. Just one thing about uh, about the Cody fight, and when we were watching it, you know, my uh, my wife was it was like she was on pins and needles and couldn't get comfortable because you know because of the the type of uh, talent that Dillashaw is, he's he's you know uh, Cody referred to him as a generic um, Dominic Cruz, but I see them as two totally separate different types of fighters where uh where Cruz um has that awkward style but he's active and he's always moving and coming forward and you know the the pace is a little faster but Dillashaw it's it's almost like he's stalking and he's he's like looking for that opening and he he moves with with a purpose and he's not I don't want to say he's not active it's just it's a different. Well, he has those awkward pauses too. Yeah, it, it, that's that, that's it's a good way to put it, you know. So it's it's something that Cody has experienced. He's well aware of it. Um, I just 
you know, it's, it's something that for both of them, you know, for TJ to uh, game plan for Cody and vice versa, totally different from, you know, seeing them as your sparring partner. But there was uh, right before, um, you know, he got knocked out. I had made the comment to my wife. I said, Cody looks like he's moving slow now. And sure enough, like 15 seconds later, the head it, kick. yeah, is when it came. And he said, I am not impressed by your performance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, I thought that it was, uh, they called it a KO, but I thought it should have been a TKO. Yeah. I mean, you know, the result's still the same that yeah, you know, the matter. title changed hands. That's a tech, that's a, you know, neither here nor there. I, right. It doesn't matter that much. Anyway, that, that about wraps us up for this. Well, not about. That does wrap us up for this episode of MMA FanCast. Reminder, one last time, we have a, a very special episode next week. Not One that you're not going to want to miss. We have a full lineup of interviews from the stars of Bellator 186. We'll get as many of them as we can on. We already have four or five booked already. And so uh, that's exciting, and we're excited to bring that to you. Um, so, yeah, that's that. So on behalf, check out, we, by the way, we got tons of f- coverage from Bellator 186 on the website, lockdown247.com. So check all that good stuff out. And that being said, on behalf of Jim Sahara Mooney. This is Ryan Middleton signing off saying thanks. God bless. And good night. If it's night, then you're If it's day, then good day. <laughs>